Hello class, um, now I want to talk about glucose homeostasis, okay? It's important for you to understand that glucose is good when it isn't in large quantities because glucose is the main fuel for our um, central nervous system. And many organs and hormones play an important role in maintaining glu glucose homeostasis, okay? Remember I talked earlier? about the stomach, how it has incretin hormones. We know about the counter-regulatory hormones that increase blood glucose by acting opposite of insulin. And some of those examples are, uh, of course, cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, growth hormone, and of course the main one that we're focused on now because we're talking about diabetes is glucagon, okay? Um, and as I said before, here's a little uh, reminder about the other ones that are in that classification of counter-regulatory hormones. Now, it's important to know, and I want you to remember this, that um, the brain cannot produce or store much glucose. So that's why the brain needs a continuous supply from circulation to prevent neural dysfunction and cellular death, okay? Um, other organs can use both glucose and fatty acids to generate uh, energy. And, you know, think about it. Um, it's always necessary that we continue to provide that glucose uh, to, in our bodies to the brain. Uh, and think about it. Um, when you don't eat for a while, you get kind of tired, uh, you get kind of foggy, you don't really think clearly, you might even get a headache. A lot of those are signs of hypoglycemia. And that's kind of the body's way of telling you that you need that supply of glucose in order for the brain to function at an optimum level, okay? So that's why uh, we need to provide that glucose uh, supply from the foods that we eat, okay? And when we have a controlled glucose level, that's, you know, uh, a very healthy state. And that's what we call glucose homeostasis. It's when our people or our patients become diabetics and they have a problem with um, glucose levels, meaning they get too high. And that's kind of the basic definition of someone who is diabetic. It is definitely char characterized by hyperglycemia. And remember, glucose is stored inside cells as glycogen um, in the liver, uh, muscles, and free fatty acids. They're also stored as triglycerides in your fat cells. And remember, fat is the most efficient means of storing energy. Because remember, if you go back to um, kind of some of your chemistry, uh, your biology, um, fat has about 9 calories of stored energy per gram where proteins in your carbohydrates only have four calories. And uh, think about how the body works. After a prolonged fast or after an illness or an injury, protein is broken down and some amino acids um, are uh, converted into glucose, okay? And um, several other uh, organs uh, and hormones play a role in maintaining that glucose homeostasis. You know, if you fast for a long period of time, when your stomach is empty, uh, it keeps blood sugar between about 70 to 100 um, by the balance between glucose uptake and glucose production by the liver, okay? And um, glucose in the blood is controlled by the emptying rate and delivery of nutrients, um, uh, to the uh, small intestines where that's where um, those foods are actually absorbed and then you know put into circulation and remember I talked about incretin hormones such as GLP-1 they secrete in response to the presence of food they increase insulin secretion they inhibit glucagon secretion and slow the rate of gastric emptying meaning that that blood sugar won't just you know, rise really, really fast, okay? Um, and, you know, in type 2 diabetics, 
hyperglycemia will result from excess liver glucose production and reduce glucose uptake in other cells because of that insulin resistance and the deficiency of insulin that is present. You know, there's still a little bit of insulin, but it's not enough, and that still um, causes someone with type 2 diabetes to still have, um, you know, hyperglycemia, okay? And when you have diabetes, gastric emptying is uh, much faster, and, um, and increased uh, emptying uh, is thought to reduce a lot of the amylin and those GLP-1 uh, type hormones, okay? So uh, I just wanted to definitely go over that with you because I think that information is extremely important uh, when we're talking about um, glucose homeostasis. All right, and don't forget that, you know, if you eat a large meal, um, the, uh, you know, the, the brain can't store that extra glucose that maybe you, um, you know, intake from a meal or something like that. It's got to um, have like a continuous source to keep our um, neurological uh, function intact and at an even keel, all right? So let's talk about what happens uh, when there is an absence of insulin, okay? And I really want you to possibly uh, listen to this part of the lecture twice because it's very important that you understand what physiological um, um, changes occur when insulin is not present, okay? We know, of course, without insulin, uh, a person will be hyperglycemic, okay? But what else is going on with this person when there is no insulin on board? Well, guess what? Uh, the body begins breaking down fats and proteins. And remember, you need insulin to move that glucose into most body tissues, all right? And when there's no glucose in the cell, the body will break down fats and protein in an attempt to provide energy and also increase the levels of counter-regulatory hormones in an attempt to make glucose uh, from other sources, okay? So... That is exactly what is uh, going on when a person becomes uh, uh, hyperglycemic and uh, there is an absence of insulin, okay? And obviously without insulin, glucose builds up, causing this a state of hyperglycemia. And it can be in varying degrees, you know. It's not like the uh, absence of insulin uh, maybe for some person, uh, blood sugars will be at a certain level, and for another, uh, blood sugars will be at another level, okay? And unfortunately, with hyperglycemia occurring, this is going to present many problems with electrolytes and um, fluid imbalances, okay? So that's what you have to remember now, that we've got a person that's in serious trouble, all right? Because without uh, insulin, uh, counter-regulatory hormones increase. And remember, those are those hormones that act in opposition of insulin. So what do you think they're going to do? They're going to make that blood sugar go up even higher. All right? And then we have these three Ps. We've kind of touched upon them a little bit when we talk somewhat about type 1 diabetes, polyuria, which just is a fancy term for frequent and excessive urination, polydipsia, excessive thirst, and polyphagia, uh, excessive eatings. And I want you to maybe stop this lecture right now and say to yourself, why does each of those uh, manifestations occur in my patient who has diabetes, okay? Um, and who has hyperglycemia? Why do they have polyuria? Why do they have polydipsia? Why do they have polyphagia? I want each and every one of you to be able to explain that to a fellow nursing student. I know why the patient has these three manifestations. I understand exactly what's going on in the body, okay? And as you can see with this type of occurrence happening, even just excessive urination, right away that should uh, raise a red flag and um, alert you as the nurse to know that now this patient is going to have fluid problems because he's 
uh, really urinating a lot and really uh, diminishing his vascular volume, okay? And basically that polydipsia is, is a response to that excessive urination. And then polyphagia, why do you think that's happening? Well, guess what? We have all this breakdown of fats and proteins, and um, the body is trying to get sources of energy from elsewhere. Um, because unfortunately with the absence of insulin, that uh, glucose is not moving into the cell. So I hope that makes sense, and I want you to kind of think out that um, as to why these unfortunate uh, manifestations are occurring with your patient, okay? So let's just talk uh, somewhat a little bit more in depth about polyuria. When there is frequent and excessive urination, it results from more of an osmotic diuresis caused by excessive uh, glucose in the urine. And as a result of this diuresis, we have sodium chloride and potassium are excreted in the urine. And of course, along with water loss. So not only are we having problems with vascular volume and excessive water loss, but now we're starting to see an excessive, uh, excessive loss of uh, electrolytes, okay? And we know what kind of problems this uh, can uh, really start to kind of snowball out of control. I mean, think about it. You got a patient on diuretics because they're going to hopefully respond to those diuretics and excessively urinate. Well, the same principles involved here. Patients that are on diuretics lose um, electrolytes. The patient that has uh, polyuria loses electrolytes through that process of osmotic diuresis, okay? And so uh, depending on how much fluid this person is is uh, losing, depending on high, how high that blood glucose level is, it's going to be more of an osmotic pressure pulling more fluid out, so there can be varying degrees of dehydration. But um, with that dehydration, that's where those thirst sensors will kick in, and polydipsia starts to occur to kind of say to the body, hey, I'm losing a lot of fluids. You need to bring more fluids into me. Uh, you need to drink more because, um, you know, I'm really becoming depleted. And because the cells uh, absolutely receive no glucose, cells begin to starve, and that triggers uh, polyphagia, uh, excessive eating. Um, and even eating vast amounts of food, the person remains in starvation until insulin is available to move glucose into the cells. And then without insulin, you have um, fats start to break down, releasing these free fatty acids. And ketone bodies are present. And what ketone bodies are, are these very small acids. And these provide a backup energy uh, source. And ketones are an abnormal breakdown product of fatty acids. And they collect in the urine when insulin is not available leading uh, to metabolic acidosis. So now these uh, uh, people start to have um, acid-base problems, and then dehydration with diabetes leads to uh, hemoconcentration because we're pulling all the water out, so the blood becomes much more concentrated and much more viscous, and so you have an increased blood concentration, hypovolemia, and uh, decreased blood volume, and as I said before, hyperviscosity, and so this is going to lead to very, very poor tissue perfusion and hypoxia, especially to the brain, okay? So now it's kind of hopefully making sense to you why your patients kind of, um, uh, kind of, you know, look the way they do when they come in with these high blood glucose levels. And remember, hypoxic cells do not metabolize glucose efficiently, and so the Krebs cycle is blocked Lactic acid is increased, so then you have um, more exaggerated acidosis occurring, okay? And these acids increase hydrogen ion and CO2 levels, causing metabolic acidosis. And they produce, uh, these products trigger the respiratory centers in the brain to increase the rate of respirations to try to excrete CO2 and blow off these acids. Because remember, if you go back to your blood gases, which was from our respiratory lecture, remember the CO2 is the acid. And uh, because the body is trying to uh, fix the problem of the metabolic acidosis, um, 
Remember, the, the primary problem is a metabolic problem, so now the respiratory system is trying to kick in and fix it. And so what will happen is the person will begin to uh, demonstrate what we call Kuzmo breathing, okay? Kuzmo respirations. And so what it will start to do will exhale a lot of acetone, giving that breath of a person um, kind of breathing this way more of a fruity odor, and when the lungs can't fix the acidosis, the pH of the blood decreases. And so not only do you have a decreased pH, but you also have decreased uh, uh, HCO3, okay? And you try to, um, uh, the lungs will try to compensate um, to decrease those uh, um, high PaCO2 levels, okay? Um, insulin deprivation can initially cause potassium depletion um, and increase fluid loss. And um, sometimes then you can see fluid moving in or, or, or electrolytes moving in and out of the cell. So sometimes the person can be uh, hypokalemia. Sometimes the patient can uh, be hyperkalemia, but whatever the case is, we've got a serious problem with electrolyte imbalances. Um, and really that totally depends on uh, the level of hydration and the severity of the acidosis and how the patient responds to treatment. Really trying to recognize this as early as we possibly can and then to treat these problems, okay? Uh, that's why uh, people, as they are diagnosed with diabetes, really need to um, be aware of polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia and seek medical attention as soon as possible, especially when they um, can kind of um, sense that they're urinating a lot more frequently than they had because uh, they may become, become, may become very symptomatic with this, being that they become hypovolemic, uh, blood pressure may drop and they may start to feel dizzy and uh, really start to feel uh, the symptoms of this, okay? Um, and, and really, if we get down to more of the pathophysiology uh, and talk about um, insufficient insulin, um, that condition also um, progresses to things like decreased glycogenesis. Uh, so there is a decreased conversion of glucose to glycogen um, and an increased glycogenolysis, which is an increase of conversion of glycogen to glucose. Remember, those counter-regulatory hormones um, are kind of enhanced when the person becomes hyperglycemic. Uh, increased gluconeogenesis, increased formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources such as amino acids. Remember, amino acids are proteins. Uh, increased uh, lipolysis, increased breakdown of triglycerides to glycerol and free fatty acids. That's why uh, the person starts to start uh, start to spill uh, these ketones in their urine. Okay. Um, increase uh, ketogenesis or an increased formation of ketones from free, adi free fatty acids. And of course, a breakdown of protein with amino acid release in the muscles. So this is a very, very serious situation. And as you can see, that it's very, very intricate. And you can see how um, hyperglycemia is just not hyperglycemia and how it affects these other G words that I've talked about. Um, and how now we have a, a, a person with metabolic acidosis. And remember, if you go back to respiratory and how we talked about arterial blood gases, how serious an acidotic state is, because now this acidotic state can definitely affect the cardiac system, okay? Um, remember, these patients may have more problems with conduction, um, arrhythmias, um, it really affects the contractility of the cardiac muscle, okay? And as you can see from this PowerPoint slide, it's just a little summary of what I've just talked about where this dehydration can be very serious with diabetes leading to those other situations of hemo concentration. Because remember, it's pulling all the water out of the vascular volume, making that volume 
much less than it was. And without that water, if you go back to hematology, remember how we talked about the components of blood? A lot of that is water and plasma. Well, all that gets um, um, definitely excreted through the kidneys, through the urine, and that's why you just have left the, the blood component and the blood becomes very hyperviscous and hypoperfusion and hypoxia. So you're going to see a very serious consequence occur when a, a person develops hypoperfusion. This goes back to what we talked about in the cardiac system. If everything is not getting perfused adequately, the brain, the heart muscle itself, especially the coronary arteries, the kidneys, then all those major organs are not going to perform uh, well. So this is why patients with uh, hyperglycemia and all these uh, characteristics of the three Ps really starts to see this snowball out of control and um, really see it manifest uh, in some very negative ways through other systems in the body. And of course that Kuzma breathing, acetone exhaled, giving that fruity odor breath. And of course um, the continuous uh, fluctuation of electrolytes in and out of the cell, causing your patients to have serious problems with um, um, potassium, uh, sodium, and of course chloride. Okay, and we know how serious that can be. You know, and, and, and just a little reminder about the liver's role in um, glucose homeostasis. Um, remember, it is the second largest organ after the skin. It's the heaviest gland. It weighs about three pounds. And remember, it's the first organ to be reached by insulin, okay? Uh, the liver will help maintain blood sugar uh, levels through uh, glycogen storage lipogenesis, glucogen breakdown, and gluconeogenesis, and the conversion of other sugars into glucose. And think about it, let's use Thanksgiving dinner as a perfect example. After a very uh, rich carbohydrate meal, the liver receives glucose via the hepatic portal vein. And the liver cells absorb most of that glucose and convert it into glycogen, okay? And remember, the storage form of glucose is called glycogenesis, all right? And it's a process whereby the liver removes excess glucose from the blood. So you can see what an important role uh, not only the pancreas in uh, keeping those blood glucose levels at a steady um, uh, level, but see exactly what the liver's role is. Excess glucose can, all be, uh, can also be processed and stored in the form of fats through lipogenesis, okay? And so, for instance, when blood sugars start to fall, the liver breaks down that glycogen stored uh, within its cells, and it converts that back into glucose and uh, releases it into the bloodstream. And that process is called glycogenolysis. Uh, the liver will provide the body with a continuous uh, supply of glucose, during, during short-term fast. And during a prolonged fast, the liver glycogen is used up, so um, other means of energy must be provided. So that's why, you know, it'll start breaking down uh, muscle, breaking down fats um, to get that uh, glucose energy stores, okay? Because there is a possibility that um, you can deplete all the... Uh, uh, glycogen, glycogen stores that are in the liver, okay? Um, the liver and your kidneys are able to synthesize glucose from amino acids, glycerol, or lactic acid, and this process is called uh, gluconeogenesis. And um, depending on availability, the liver uh, um, can convert fructose, sucrose, and galactose into glucose. The liver basically acts as a glucose buffer, and it can help keep blood sugars in a range of about 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter, okay? So um, just a little um, extra information just to uh, kind of stress the importance of um, 
the liver in regards to keeping um, blood glucose is within that um, normal range. And another little bit of information that I just want to um, kind of bring to your attention because um, I think we're always under the impression that um, all tissues require insulin for glucose uptake. Well, that's not necessarily true. And this is a little bit of added information that I think as nurses we need to know. This was not in your Iggy book, but I'm giving it to you as an outside source because I think it's really important that you know. Um, all body tissues and organs require a constant supply of glucose. However, not all tissues require insulin for glucose uptake, okay? Your brain, your liver, your intestines, and your renal tubules do not require insulin to transfer glucose into their cells. Do you guys want me to repeat that again? It's four things. The brain, the liver, the intestines, and the renal tubules do not require insulin to transfer glucose into their cells. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and adipose tissue do require insulin for glucose movement into the cell. I will repeat those again. Skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, and adipose tissue do, not requ do require insulin for glucose movement into the cell. Normal blood glucose is maintained in healthy people primarily through the actions of insulin and glucagon. Okay. Increased blood glucose levels, amino acids, and fatty acids can stimulate those beta cells in the pancreas to produce insulin. So please, I hope you're taking notes on what I'm telling you in this lecture, that all body tissues and organs do require a constant supply of glucose. However, not all tissues require insulin for glucose uptake. But think about it. There's a lot of skeletal muscles, a lot of cardiac muscle, and adipose tissue. So we can understand why our patients get into trouble when they have hyperglycemia, even though the brain, the liver, the intestines, and the renal tubules do not require insulin to transfer glucose into their cells. So please, make sure you understand that. We will review that again next week because I really want you to to understand that I think that's really an important piece of information that we as nurses need to know when we're really trying to understand the pathology and all the conditions that exist when our patients um, are diagnosed with diabetes.